Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66 of Hour of the Truth. Today is the 25th of January 2018, a Thursday evening, so I'm coming close to the next wonderful Sabbath that awaits me. And I have come to the table today to do the 18th reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits, the book by Edmond Paris, that was published in 1974, uh, 75. Um, Yesterday I was recording part 17 and uh, I guess you saw that and we didn't do much reading of this book because it was to me very important to share with you what Bill Hughes had to say in his book The Secret Terrorists on World War II and I hope that you enjoyed the three quarters of an hour excursion that we took from The Secret History of the Jesuits to that book. Now today, it didn't even, I didn't even plan it, but this is how the Holy Spirit works sometimes. My brother Brett Norman is with me and you can see that of course because you see the little icon on Skype on top of your screen here. And Brett is joining me from Minnesota and I hope he can um, be the full hour with me while I'm reading the book and he will support me in commenting, asking questions and, uh, you know, participating in the reading as you know from other things that we did before. But he is on standby with his bus and I hope that his bus will leave him for an hour at least so that he can finish <laughs> the recording together here with me. So, Brett, thank you very much for taking your time and joining me in this reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits. How are you doing? Uh -huh. Wonderful. Thank you, Yerk. Thank you for inviting me. And it's uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, be participating in these types of uh, readings and discussions on, on such a, a incredible book. And uh, I think that uh, this is one of the books I am just very, very eager to learn more about because it represents, you know, the darker side of history that never gets talked about. Yeah, you know, it just comes to my mind. I didn't even think of that when we first met you and I yes. some years ago. Yes. You were, you were pulling out this book and starting to read this, and I was giving you the advice, please, Brett, do not do that, because right. this is right. really not made for you. This book is too difficult yes. with all these names and all that stuff. It was it's really true. It, it you was, know what? It, it's true. It's it was true. A, it was a quote unquote torture to listen to you reading that. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and right. I, I still hope that you don't uh, are, are, that that you are not mad at me for that. No, uh, no, 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 not at all. It was just uh, that's kind of how it works, though. You're um, the way I look at it is that uh, it was in, you know, this was the day before the uh, uh, Antichrist. Pope Francis came, or rather Jorge Bergoglio, came to speak to joint session of Congress. And uh, I was in uh, panic mode. <laughs> yeah, I, I just was, uh, you know, I normally don't react that way. But maybe it was just one of those things where I, just, I needed to be, someone needed to tell me and you told me. So no big deal. I just deleted the video and... And uh, I erased it from my hard drives, and I don't even hardly remember it, <laughs> which is good. Well, okay, today you will have uh, another possibility to have a read into that book. Um, I uh, I think that you have the book in front of you. Do you have the physical sure book do. or the PDF? I do. I have the physical book, page 139, section 5, chapter 3, German Aggression and the Jesuits, Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia. Yeah, that's correct. Even though you sent me the wonderful book of the Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris, for which I'm yeah. still very grateful, I will read from the PDF because this is much easier for my eyes here. And of course, I'm using a desktop camera. Oh, and, and you can you take notes and put those in, yeah, too. Yeah, and with so. that desktop camera also, the people can read along. That's know, perfect. What perfect. I read. So oh, absolutely. for the moment, because we don't share a screen, because I don't want to... <laughs> well, if anything, much. the book comes in handy when you're out on the road and, and you can just put it in your glove box and yeah. have it there. That's true. And whenever you want to pull it out and, and take and, and look at something again, then it's a hard physical copy, and that's something that's really nice to have. That's right. So for the moment, I have next to the PDF a picture of Juggler 66 in conversation with Brett Norman, so people know that we are talking right now. 
and uh, I will start putting up the other pictures that I have prepared for this because I have read, I think, about the first three pages of what I was going to do today and for the rest I have not prepared the reading, so this is cold for me as it is for probably all of my listeners. But anyway, without any further ado and uh, don't want to give Scott the chance to interrupt, uh, I'm going to start the book reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits as... Uh, Brett so rightfully said on page 139 in the book or 138 in the PDF. Chapter 3, mm. we are still dealing with the Infernal Cycle, which is the undertitle of uh, this chapter. German aggressions and the Jesuits. Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. You have to be um, considering every time that when it says here German aggressions and the Jesuits, that the Germans were controlled by the Jesuits in Second World War. Mm. So when we are speaking about German aggressions and the Jesuits, it's actually the aggressions of the Jesuits using the German people, the German government and the German people to do their bidding. That is the same as they do today in the United States of America, when they use the United States of America military, when they misuse, abuse the United States of America government, which they themselves installed, and they do exactly the same thing. Nothing has changed, and as the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun, people, also not with World War II. The Jesuits were controlling Germany from top to bottom. And they were controlling the Third Reich government, meaning Adolf Hitler, his NSDAP party, and the whole Nazi regime via people in the back, like Franz von Papen, who we are going to talk about. But anyway, I will start reading now, and it starts here in the very first sentence. Let us see how the Anschluss was prepared. I told you the Anschluss mm -hmm. was that part in 1938 when Austria got connected to the German Reich. In Germany they said the coming home of the lost children, of the lost child of Austria, which has always been run by the Habsburgs, which was always arch-Catholic, and as I told you in earlier sessions in the readings of this book, you have to understand that the Roman Catholic Church tried to take power in Germany by increasing the numbers of Catholics. So Austria was 100% Catholic. It was always the high place of the Jesuits and the high place of the Catholics in Europe, in Austria. And they integrated this now back into Germany because that was already there before and had been split up in the Second Reich and now they are pulling it into in the Third Reich again. The coming home of Austria, that is the Anschluss. Anschluss means the um, catching up, the connection with. That's uh, quite a word how you can translate that. Mm. First of all, and by quote-unquote providential, providential, which means in their understanding, in the Roman Catholic understanding, godly synchronism, when Mussolini seized power in Italy, thanks to Don Sturzo, and we remember him, I showed you pictures of him, who was controlling um, the uh, party in uh, Italy, Don Sturzo, he was a Jesuit and chief of the Catholic party, Monsignor Saipo, and of him I have a picture here, and I want to just uh, show you that picture. We have here, of course, Stempfle, that is from last time, and here we have a picture of Ignaz Steipel, uh, Seipel, sorry, Ignaz Seipel, who is a Jesuit. He became Chancellor of Austria. So he was the political, the Jesuit puppet on the government chair in Austria. He held that position until 1929 with an interregnum of two years. And during those decisive years, he led the Austrian interior politics on to the reactionary and clerical road. His successors followed him on that road, which led to the absorption of that country into the German bloc. Yeah, that's also how you can call the Anschluss, an absorption, an usurpation. The bloody repression of working class uprisings earned him the nickname Keine Milde Cardinal, which means cardinal without mercy. No mercy is keine milde in German. Quote, in the early days of May 1936, von Papen entered into secret negotiations with Dr. Schusnick, 
who was an Austrian Chancellor. And I'm going to put his picture up right here. You see Mr. Seis Inquart, who we will get to know a little bit later in this reading, on the one hand, and on the other hand in this picture here you see uh, Schusnick. And this Dr. Chusnik was an Austrian Chancellor working on his weak point and showed him how advantages a reconciliation with Hitler would be as far as the Vatican's interests were concerned. The argument may seem odd, but Schusnik was very devout and von Papen, the Pope's Chamberlain. I already mentioned von Papen before and we will mention him again during this reading, the Knight of Malta, the Jesuit-trained Pope's Chamberlain, who is the power behind Hitler. It is always in Germany the Vice-Chancellor who holds the power, as it is the Vice-President in the United States of America that holds the power. When it was Robert, Re uh, Robert, uh, Robert I said Ronald Reagan in the 80s, behind him was Bush. He was the actual power. When it was uh, Bill Clinton, even there behind him was Bush. Yeah? The, mm. the, um, the deputy, I just wanted to say, <laughs> the second oh, in command. Oh, vice president. The vice president, yeah. thanks. Yeah. So thanks. Right. The vice president is always the person in real power. The one in front is just a puppet, a good actor. Like Hitler was a very good actor, but he was no dictator in the sense that we understand it. Yeah? yeah, I think we could call him a front man too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He, he was a front man. He was to take, of course, the blame for yeah, everything. Just the putting people. on a facade, right? Yeah. yeah, Yeah. it's like putting on a mask, you know. Mm -hmm, that's uh, right. It's like when uh, the Pope comes out, the Pope just wears the mask of the devil. Huh? Uh, it's, mm. it's, it's the devil who wears the mask of the Pope. That's the mm -hmm. way. And uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's the same yep, with these political to... puppets. Mm. So not surprisingly, it was the secret Chamberlain, so von Papen, who led the whole affair which ended on the 11th of March 1938 with the resignation of the pious Austrian, uh, with, uh, of the pious Schusnik, who was a pupil of the Jesuits, in favor of Seis Inquart, who you see on this picture here on your left, chief of the Austrian Nazis. The following day, the German troops entered Austria, and the puppet government of Seis Inquart proclaimed the union of the country to the Reich. This event was welcomed by an enthusiastic declaration of Jena's Archbishop, Jesuit Cardinal Initzer. And there is a picture of him right here. Quote, on the 15th of March, the German press published the following declaration from Cardinal Initzer. Quote, the priests and the faithful must unhesitatingly uphold the great German state and the Führer who struggled to set up Germany's power, honor and prosperity is in accord with the wishes of providence. This is end of the quote, even though it doesn't say that here. The newspapers printed a facsimile of this declaration to dispel any doubt as to its authenticity. Reproductions were posted up on walls in Vienna and in the other Austrian cities. Cardinal Jesuit Initzer had, with his own hand, written the following words before his signature. Und Heil Hitler! Three days later, the whole of the Austrian Episcopate addressed a pastoral letter to its diocesans. The Italian newspapers published the text of this letter on the 28th of March. It was a straightforward adhesion to the Nazi regime whose virtues were highly extolled. Cardinal Initzer, the highest representative of the Roman Church in Austria, so in other words you can say he was the nuncio, as was Eugenio Percelli between 1917 and 1929 in Germany. This cardinal, the highest representative of the Roman Church in Austria, also wrote his declaration, in his declaration, quote, I invite the chiefs of youth organizations to prepare their union to the organization of the German Reich." Unquote. So not only did the Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna, followed by his episcopate, throw in his lot with Hitler most enthusiastically, but he handed also, uh, over also the quote-unquote Christian 
read Catholic youth, to be trained according to Nazi methods. These methods had been officially condemned in the terrible encyclical letter mit brennender Sorge, which reads with burning uh, concern in English. And I have a picture, of course, of that paper also here, mit brennender Sorge. Mm. Then the Mercure de France justifiably observed, quote, These bishops have not taken a decision which involves the Church as a whole on their own accord. The Holy See gave them directives which they merely followed. This is obvious. Mm -hmm. But what other directives could be expected from this Holy See which brought to power Mussolini, which brought to power Hitler and Franco and in Belgium created the Christus Rex of Leon de Grel? You remember, and I advised you all to watch chapter 12 of Behind the Dictators, where I go extensively into Leon de Grel and the Belgium Rexit Party and the Belgium Nazis during the Third Reich. We understand then why English authors such as F. A. Riley, Seeker and Warbook object to the politics of Antichrist Pope Pius XI, which favored fascist movements everywhere. As for the Anschluss, François Charles Roux tells us why the Church was so much in favor of it. You remember Charles Roux was the ambassador to the Holy See of France at that time. Quote, Eight million Austrian Catholics united to the Catholics of the Reich could make a German Catholic body more able to make its weight felt. Charles Roux tells you what I have told you in earlier readings of this book already. The plan was to take away the power of Protestant Prussia and to give it over, leverage uh, it over to the south of Germany, Bavaria and of course with the Anschluss Austria. And don't forget, Hitler was an Austrian. He was not a German. He was born in Braunau in Austria. And the Catholics were always powerful in the south of Germany, never so much in the north. So they wanted to leverage the power from Protestant Prussia to the south of Germany. And that's why from the south, from Bavaria and Austria in this case, the fascists came into Germany. Poland was in the same situation, the author continues, as Austria when Hitler, after having invaded it, annexed part of it in the name of the Fatherland. A few more million Catholics to reinforce the German contingent under the Roman obedience. The Holy See could only be in favor of this in spite of all its love for its quote-unquote dear Polish people. In fact, it did not frown at the brutal regrouping of Catholics in Central Europe, according to the plan of Jesuit General Halke von Lederkowski. The Vatican's licensed Thurifus, Thurifus, I, I looked that word up today, so these are the people who wear mm. this little smoky stuff uh, during the Mass, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. The Vatican's licensed Thurifus keep on reminding their readers that Antichrist Pope Pius XII quote-unquote protested against the aggression in the encyclical letter Summi Pontificatus. In reality, his ludicrous doc this ludicrous document, like all other such documents, which numbers no less than 45 pages, contains only one phrase at the end. Concerning Poland, crushed by Hitler. And this short allusion is an advice to the Polish people to pray much to the Virgin Mary. Again, a reason for me to bring up that I want to go, one of the next projects in English that I'm going to read to you, it's the book that Tom Fress read in 2009 on First Amendment Radio, Queen of Islam, Queen of Rome, Queen of All. I'm going to read that book on my channel, so watch out for that, but it's going to be a little while. There are so many things to do. This sh is, uh, and this short allusion, this sentence is an advice to the Polish people to pray much to the Virgin Mary. What does the Bible say? Who we pray to? 
Doesn't it say in Matthew 6 that Jesus told us, and when you pray, you pray like this, Holy Father, who thou art in heaven? Isn't that the way a Christian is supposed to pray and not to the Virgin Mary? Now the contrast is striking between those few words of trite condolences and the lettering pages devoted to fascist Italy and the exaltation of the Lateran Treaty. And again I have a picture prepared of the Lateran Treaty. Just give me a second. Oh, no, that's not, <laughs> mm. that's not it. I have to take the list and then the next one. The Lateran Treaty of February 1929. The picture you see here on the right right now. The contrast is striking between those few words of trite condolences and the nettering pages devoted to fascist Italy and the exaltation of the Lateran Treaty. This treaty was concluded by the Holy See and Mussolini, Hitler's collaborator, who, at the time when the Pope was writing his encyclical letter, delivered a scandalous speech as a challenge to the world and started it with the words Liquidata la Polonia which even you Americans understand as liquidate Poland, exterminate Poland. But what risks are there in using this derisory alibi when preaching to the converted? Besides, how many of them would be anxious to examine such references? Nevertheless, when we study the Vatican's behavior in this affair, what do we see? First of all, we see the nuncio in Warsaw, Monsignor Cortesi, who is in the picture right here. Urged the, uh, first of all, we saw the nuncio in Warsaw, Monsignor Cortesi, urged the Polish government to give in to Hitler in everything. Danzig, the corridor, the territories where German minorities live. You know, we are speaking about Danzig, that city that is today, of course, in Poland and that was taken from the Germans after World War I. The corridor is what cut off East Prussia from the rest of the Reich. You have to understand when you watch at the, uh, at the map of the German Reich at that time, you had Germany very far expanding into the east, then you had Poland come in between, and then you had a cut off little piece in the east, where today uh, a lot of the Baltic states are, like uh, uh, Estland, uh, Lithuania and that stuff. Very near there was East Prussia that was cut off from the Reich so that was a corridor in between. A corridor meaning that was a piece of Poland in between so you couldn't get from the western part of Germany to the eastern part of Prussia without going through Poland. So you had to cross a foreign country to stay in your own country. That was that corridor and that was of course um, causing a lot of problems economically and also physically for the people living there and here Monsignor Cortesi urges the Polish government to give in into everything that Hitler wanted from the Poles. He wanted Danzig back, he wanted the corridor done away with, he wanted his Groß German Reich, his big German Reich all together without the interference of Poland in there. So this nuncio in Warsaw, he is, a nuncio is the highest Roman Catholic within the country. And of course you would expect that he deals in the interest of the people in the country he serves. No, because these people always only serve one country, they only, only serve one boss. When they are Roman Catholics, they serve the Pope, they serve the Roman Catholic Church and they serve Rome. And when they are Jesuits, like most of these nuncios are, they even serve only the Black Pope. They have no allegiance to the country they live in. Monsignor Cortesi urges, therefore, the Polish government to give in to, in, uh, to, give in to everything that Hitler demanded. Give him Danzig, give him the corridor, the territories where the German minorities live. Then, when this is done, we see also the Holy Father lend his help to the aggressor, meaning Germany, when trying to make Paris and London ratify the amputation of a large part of his quote-unquote dear Poland. 
If Poland was so dear to Monsignor Cortesi, why did he order the Polish people to give in to everything that Hitler demanded of them? Maybe you can answer that question, Brett. Jeez. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my, oh my. Yeah, this is exactly why I couldn't read this book. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, very involved in in Europe, and uh, you know, if you're living in America, you're very isolated from Europe, so you don't know much, you know. Yeah. In terms of history, in terms of uh, just overall, you know, it's um, it's interesting um, to me. But continue. I, I don't need to interrupt this too much. Oh, you're not interrupting when I'm asking you. You know. But that yeah. was that was that was kind of a sarcastic question because of course you Oh I know, uh, I know, I know. Of course yeah, you absolutely give a, <laughs> give a valid answer to that. <laughs> Continuing here, to those who would be surprised at such behavior towards a Catholic country, we will quote a famous president. After the first division of Poland in seventeen seventy two, a catastrophe in which the Jesuits' intrigues played a large part. Antichrist Pope Clement XIV, when writing to the Empress of Austria, Marie Therese, expressed his satisfaction as follows. Quote, the invasion and division of Poland were not done for political reasons only. It was in the interests of religion and necessary to the spiritual profit of the Church that the court of Vienna should extend its domination over Poland as much as possible. Unquote. Obviously, there is nothing new under the sun, especially at the Vatican. In 1939, there was no need to change one single word in that cynical declaration apart from, quote, the spiritual prophet of the church, unquote, which, is, uh, which this time consisted of several million Polish Catholics joining the Great Reich. This fact easily explains the parsimony of papal condolences in Sami Pontificatus. In Czechoslovakia, we come to the next country that will be usurped by the German Reich, the Vatican did even better. It provided Hitler with one of its own prelates, a secret chamberlain to be made into the head of this satellite state of the Reich. Quote, the Anschluss had made a great noise in Europe. From now on, the Hitlerian threat was hovering over the Republic of Czechoslovakia, and war was in the air. But, as the Vatic uh, at the Vatican, nobody seemed concerned. Now let us listen to François Charles Roux again. Quote, in the middle of August, I had tried to persuade the Pope that he should speak in favor of peace. A just peace, of course. My first attempts were unsuccessful. But from the beginning of September 1938 on, when the international crisis reached its worst level, I started gathering at the Vatican soothing impressions contrasting strangely with the rapidly deteriorating situation. Unquote. All my attempts, adds the former French ambassador, received the same answer from Antichrist Pope Pius XI. Quote, it would be useless, it would be unnecessary, it would even be inopportune. Unquote. I could not understand his, his obstinacy in keeping silent. Unquote. Therefore, again, I just want, want to remind you that you have an esoteric and an exoteric Vatican policy. You have an open policy for the lay people and you have an inner policy for the enlightened and for the uh, people who get the whole picture and who plan the whole picture. And of course the Pope would say it would be useless, unnecessary and inopportune because he pulls the strings because after, uh, after everything that Hitler does. So of course it would be useless, unnecessary and inopportune. He can't say on the one hand do this and on the other, say, other hand do that. Not not officially. He can't do anything. Therefore he stays silent. The same silence that Pope Pius XII has kept. The quote-unquote Hitler's Pope, Eugenio Percelli, who will be Pope from 1939 until 
1958. We come to that. Events were soon going to explain this silence, as I just tried to do also. It was first of all the annexation of Sudetenland by the Reich, which the support of the Christian Social Party, of course, this annexation was ratified by the Munich court, and the Republic of Czechoslovakia was divided. So we have the Czechs and the Slovaks. But Hitler, who had undertaken to respect its territorial integrity, intended in reality to annex the Czech countries, independent of Slovakia, and reign over it as well by his own appointee. It was easy for him to attain these ends, as most of the main political Slovakian chiefs were Catholic ecclesiastics, according to Walter Hagen, and amongst these the priest Hlinka, who was a Jesuit, had at his disposal, dis, uh, at his disposal a guard trained on Nazi SA principles. And here is a picture of uh, Andrei Hilinka in 1937, so that you have him in picture too. Another Jesuit cardinal, a Jesuit priest. We know, the author continues, according to canon law, no priest can accept a public post or a political mandate without the Holy See's consent. Why not? Because the church is a state, because the spiritual is above the temporal. So when you, as a spiritual member of the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church, want to engage in temporal affairs, like a, uh, an office, or something in politics or wherever, you have to have the consent of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Yeah? There has to be the Holy See's consent with it. This is confirmed and explained by the Jesuit de Soras. Quote, How could it be otherwise? We have said so already. A priest, by virtue of the character his ordination ma uh, marked him with, by virtue of the official functions he exercises within the church itself, by virtue of the cassock he wears, is bound to act as a Catholic, at least when the public action is concerned. Where the priest is, there is the church. So what does that mean that when you see a priest in the political realm? Where you see the priest, you see the church. Did you ever hear of a separation of church and state? When you see a priest within the political realm, there is no separation of church and state. And the Roman Catholic Church is the prime example of the combination of church and state. It was, when, uh, it was then with the Vatican's consent that members of the clergy sat in the Czechoslovak parliament. Still more, one of these priests had to have the Holy See's approval when the Führer himself invested him as head of state and later conferred on him the highest Hitlerian distinctions, the Iron Cross and the Black Eagle de Decoration. As anticipated, on the 15th of March 1939, that is half a year before the outbreak of World War II, Hitler annexed the rest of Bohemia and Moravia, and put the Republic of Slovakia, which he had created with a stroke of his pen, quote, unquote, under his protection. Now, <laughs> you have to understand, of course, that Czech, uh, the, the Czech Republic was mainly... Um, inhabited by Catholics, and Slovakia there were a lot of Protestants. And now Adolf Hitler, with a stroke of his pen, puts the majority uh, inhabited by Protestant country of Slovakia, quote-unquote, under his protection. Think of the consequences. When a Roman Catholic puts Protestants under his protection. At the head, he placed Monsignor Tiso, and the picture you will have right here, this is uh, Tiso with Hitler uh, greeting each other 
uh, at the train at an official visit. That's the picture that you see here on the right. At the head he placed Monsignor Tiso, so that's Hitler who placed him, who dreamed of combining Catholicism and Nazism. <laughs> Where have we had that before? Huh? <laughs> you remember Civilta Catholica, the quote? But I don't, I don't uh, say that right now because that comes up a little bit later here anyway. Um, who dreamed of combining Catholicism and Nazism. A noble ambition. Well, it depends on what do you see as noble, of course. And easily realized, as it had already been proved by the German and Austrian episcopates. Catholicism and Nazism, proclaimed Monsignor Tiso, have much in common. They work hand in hand at reforming the world. Here we should maybe take a little second and think about what the author writes, what Monsignor Tiso says here. Catholicism and Nazism have much in common. They work hand in hand at reforming the world. This is a statement of what the New World Order will be. Catholicism, the Universal Church and Nazism working hand in hand together. And isn't that what you see the last years in the United States of America also? The rising of the Fourth Reich, the rising of uh, quote-unquote Republican or conservatism, meaning the right wing getting more and more power. Now with the Republican president after George W. Bush the traitor, you have Trump the traitor in office. Don't you see how you go more and more into fascism into Nazism in your own country that is, as I told you already in the last video, ruled since the 1930s by uh, executive orders, exactly the same way as Hitler ruled his country when he got the executive orders from the president at that time, that he could take out um, the Reichstag and rule on his own hand the same things what the American presidents do when they rule by executive order. They don't rule through Congress and Senate, but by executive order. Catholicism and Nazism, and this is why I highlighted this in green here on this page, so that you can really read it for yourself and let it sink in, proclaimed Monsignor Tiso have much in common. They work hand in hand at reforming the world. Such must have been also the Vatican's opinion, as, in spite of the terrible encyclical letter mit brennender Sorge, with burning concern, it did not haggle over its approval of the Gauleiter priest. Gauleiter is a political uh, position and priest is a ecclesiastical position. So this is a little hint from the author here not to haggle over its approval of the Gauleiter priest. In June 1940, Radio Vatican announced quote, the declaration of Monsignor Tiso, chef of the Slovakian state, stating his intention to build up Slovakia according to a Catholic plan has the full approval of the Holy See. Of course, he also says here, according to a Christian plan, but you have to read that according to a Catholic plan. Let's read it again that we understand this. The declaration of Monsignor Tiso, chief of the Slovakian state, stating his intention to build up Slovakia according to a Roman Catholic plan, has the full approval of the Holy See. What does that mean? Well, in the first place it means to get rid of any opposition. And what are the opposition for the Roman Catholics? The Protestants who lived in Slovakia. Tiso's regime in Slovakia was especially afflicting for the Protestant Church of that country, which comprised one-fifth of the population. Monsignor Tiso tried to reduce the Protestant influence to its minimum, and even eliminate it. Influential members of the Protestant Church were sent to concentration camps. Just a confirmation of what I told you already half an hour ago. These could count themselves fortunate, 
as we consider this declaration from the Jesuits General Wenz, a Prussian who was uh, the General of the Society of Jesus between 1906 and 1915, quote, The Church can condemn heretics to death, as any rights they have is because of our forbearance. <laughs> Yeah, and <clears throat> this is why I am always against human rights. Mm -hmm. Because that's exactly the same thing, right, Brad? That's right, yeah. Let me ask you a question, Brad. Mm -hmm. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, do you anywhere in the Bible find a place where God gives man rights? No. Well, uh, he gives man law. He yes. gives law. He, he gives, gives rules. man prophecy. Yes. He gives rules. He gives ordinations. Yes. Yes. But he never but rights? gives us rights. No. And you see, that's the difference. With mm -hmm. God and the Bible, we have duties. Yes. And with the Antichrist here on the earth, we have rights. Rights are the opposite of duties. And again, the Bible is 180% opposite to the teaching of the Antichrist. Now yeah, the and another thing that throws you off is, is the, the differentiation between R-I-T-E-S and R-I-G-H-T-S. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> and that can really throw people too, because you could be meaning R-I-T-E-S which is a ritualistic form rather than a legalistic form. So, yeah, it just gets really confusing if you don't read it yourself and comprehend that little detail here and there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I just thought I'd throw that in the mix. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's good. Uh, we have to understand that the Jesuit general, superior general of the Jesuits, Werns, who was a German, a Prussian, says... The church can condemn heretics to death as any rights they have is because of our forbearance. That means Protestants only have mm. rights that the Roman Catholic Church gives them. Mm -hmm. And when the Roman Catholic Church gives rights, it can only re also revoke these rights. Again, dear listener, go to my reading of Rulers of Evil and then read this... Um, uh, oh, I'm, 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 I've, I've lost it now. Uh, Directorium mm -hmm. Inquisitorum. That is part of Rulers of Evil. Go there and read that Directorium Inquisitorum. And there are many, many points which exactly confirm what the Jesuit General Verns says here. The church can condemn heretics to death as any rights they have is because of our forbearance. Mean nobody who is outside of the church of Rome has any rights except the church, uh, except the rights the church gives them. This is what he says. Because when you're outside of the realm of the Roman Catholic Church, of what the Roman Catholic Church teaches outside the Roman Catholic Church, there is no salvation anyway. When you're outside of this, you only live by the grace of the Antichrist. You only live by the grace of the rights they give you. And when they don't want to give you these rights anymore, they revoke them because you only have them by their forbearance, by their quote-unquote grace. I don't want to misuse that word, but I think mm. that is quite fitting here in this, uh, in, in this part. Do you agree, Brad? I do. Yes, absolutely right. Now let us see now what kind of apostolic gentleness was used by the Gauleiter prelate Tiso towards the Jews. In 1941, the quote goes on, the, fir uh, the first contingent of Jews from Slovakia and Upper Silesia arrived at Auschwitz. From the start, those who were not able to work are sent to the gas chambers in the room of the building containing the crematory furnaces." Unquote. <laughs> I prepared yeah. a little comment to that. Really? You gas people, 
with a flammable gas, because that's what Cyclone B is, it is highly flammable, next to burning ovens? This is one of six million questions to be asked on this topic. I leave you with your own thoughts, but please read this again. In 1941, the first contingent of Jews from Slovakia and Upper Silesia arrived at Auschwitz. From the start, those who were not able to work are sent to the gas chamber. The gas chamber in a room of the building containing the crematory furnaces. So when you want to cremate a human body, you need more than a thousand degrees of fire, centigrade. Yeah? And you are heating up these crematory furnaces right next in the other room where you gas people with a highly flammatory gas. Think about it for yourself. I leave you with your own thoughts on that. I'm not going to even comment on that. Now, who wrote this? A witness who could not be challenged. Lord Russell of Liverpool. And Lord Russell of Liverpool, because the author says here he was a witness that could not be challenged. I disagree with the author here. Because Lord Russell of Liverpool was honored as a commander of the Order of the British Empire. Are those Bible-believing Jesus-following Christians? I challenge him all the way. So when the author says here, this witness could not be challenged, I challenge him all the way. A commander of the Order of the British Empire? Please. No credibility in my eyes. Mm-hmm. This Lord Russell of Liverpool, a judicial counsellor of the trials of war criminals. And we all know that the judges who were uh, at the trials of war criminals were all in the game. Just look at Nuremberg and what happened over there. It's just a joke. You're making the wolf the keeper of the hen house. Mm -hmm. So the Holy See had not lent one of his prelates to Hitler in vain. The Jesuit head of state was doing a good job, and the satisfaction expressed by Radio Vatican is understandable. To have been Auschwitz's first provider, what a glory for this quote-unquote holy man for the whole company of Jesuits. In fact, this triumph lacked nothing. At the time of the liberation, this prelate was handed over to Czechoslovakia by the Americans, condemned to death in 1946 and hanged the palm for a martyr. Quote, Anything done against the Jews, we do it because of our love for this nation of ours. The love for our fellow men and the love for our country have developed into a fruitful fight against the enemies of Nazism. Unquote. Another high dignitary of the Roman Church, a neighboring country, could have appropriated this declaration of Monsignor Tiso to himself. For, if the foundations of the Slovakian city of God were, were hatred and persecution, according to the steadfast tradition of the Church, what can be said of the eminently Catholic state of Croatia, Croatia offspring of the collaboration between the killer Pervelic and Monsignor Stepinac, and with assistance of the pontifical legate Marconi. So I just have to see here, I'm going to look up a picture from Stepinac that I can show you here. Just give me a second, because I have to look up the picture on my computer here. And, no, not Brad, Stepinac I said. Huh? <laughs> 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 I didn't, he didn't take it here, so... Um, I have a few pictures of Stepinac. This one is a color picture. Maybe we can use this. This is Aloysio Stepinac, uh, who was responsible, of course, for the genocide with the Ustashi in Croatia during the Second World War. Uh, we have here a picture of uh, Archbishop Stepinac, Stepinac together with Papal Nuncio Marcone, who was I? Uh, who I just read about here? So I'm gonna leave this picture on here, mm. and you can have a look at this. And they are guided by a priest on the one hand, and uh, in the back of the picture you see a German uh, general 
running behind them. Monsignor Stepinac and the assistance of the Pontifical Legate Mark Colney, who you have here in the picture. We would have to look back as far as the conquest of the New World, couple the actions of the adventurers of Cortes and the no less ferocious converter monks to find something worth comparing with the atrocities of those Ustashis upheld, commanded and prompted by madly fanatical clerics. What these assassins in the name of God, as they were so rightly nicknamed by Monsieur Evre Laurier, did over four years defies all imagination, and the annals of the Roman Church, even though so rich in such material, cannot produce the equivalent in Europe. Do we need to add that the crony of the bloodthirsty anti pervelage was Monsignor Stepinac, another Jesuit? And you remember me going into this reading in the mm. part before here, uh, or the Estashi, in reading The Secret Terrorists from Bill Hughes. Now we are even getting much deeper into the Eustachy in Edmond Paris's book. Mm -hmm. The Croatian terrorist organization of the Eustachy, led by Pavelic, had come to the notice of the French people through the assassination in Marseille of King Alexander I of Yugoslavia and our foreign affairs minister, Louis Bartou, in 1934. Quote, As Mussolini's government was obviously mixed up in the crime, unquote, the extradition of Pervelic, who had taken refuge in Italy, was demanded by the French government. The Duce obviously took care not to grant it, and the Assise Court of Aix-en-Provence had to impose the death sentence by default on the head of the Eustaches. This chief of terrorists, hired by Mussolini, worked for the Italian expansion of the Adriatic coast. When, in 1941, Hitler and Mussolini invaded and divided Yugoslavia, this supposed Croatian patriot was put by them at the head of the satellite state they created under the name of Independent State of Croatia. On the 18th of May of that same year, in Rome, Pervelic offered the crown of that state to the Duke of Spolit, who took the name Tomislav II. Of course, he took care never to set foot on the blood-stained soil of his pseudo-kingdom. On the same day, Pius XII, Antichrist Pope Pius XII, gave a private audience to Pervelic, and his friends, of whom was Monsignor Salis Sevis, vice-general to Monsignor Stepinac. So the Holy See did not fear shaking hands with a certified murderer, sentenced to death by default for the murder of King Alexander I and Louis Bartou, a chief of terrorists having the most horrible crimes on his conscience. In fact, on the 18th of May, 1941, when Antichrist Pope Pius XII gladly welcomed Pavelic and his gang of killers, the massacre of Orthodox Croats was at the height, currently with forced conversions to Catholicism. It was the Serbian minority of the population they were after, as the author Walter Hagen explains, quote, Thanks to the Eustachy, the country was so transfor soon transformed into a bloody chaos. The deadly hatred of the new masters was directed toward the Jews and Serbians, who were officially outlawed. Whole villages, even whole regions, were systematically wiped out. As the ancient tradition wanted Croatia and the Catholic faith, Serbia and the Orthodox Church to be synonymous, the Orthodox believers were constrained to join the Catholic Church. These compulsory conversions constituted the completion of Croatization. Croatization is just another word for Catholicization. And, dear listener, let me tell you, well, I'll show you another picture here of uh, Stepinac. Uh, this is here, Pope John Paul II kneels while praying in front of the tomb of Cardinal Stepinac. So there you see this uh, cardinal in this tomb laying here and the Pope kneeling before it and praying. This is uh, Franjo Kuraric, uh, some, somebody else, and Stepinak with his uh, 
members, another picture, stepping knife on the far right with two Catholic priests at the funeral of President of the Croatian Parliament Marko Dojan in this September 1944. That's a nice picture that you have here. Have a look at this. Um, what I wanted to tell, what, what I wanted to say is um, what we are reading here about uh, the Croatian war and about the genocide that uh, took place against the Orthodox and never forget, please, the Orthodox are not Christians. It's Orthodox Catholics. They are Catholics as are the Roman Catholics, but they are Orthodox uh, Catholics. The difference is that they are not ultramontane, that they do not accept the power of the Pope as ultimate ruler of the world and ultimate ruler of the Church. And um, they have a problem with the Mary idolatry of the Western Church. And that's why the Orthodox Church split up in 1054. But they are, in heart, still Catholics. They are no Christians. But that, of course, does not give any reason for the Roman Catholics to kill them off in a genocide. Yeah? And that's what happened there in Croatia in the time that we are reading here. Yeah? So this Croatization or this Catholization of this uh, Orthodox people uh, if you want to read another book on this, I can advise you to read from the same author, Edmond Paris, the book uh, Convert or Die. And he goes very much into the situation in Croatia in that book, and you can read all about it. But let's continue for a little moment in the book reading here, The Secret History of the Jesuits. Andrija Artukovic. Minister of the Interior was the great organizer of the massacres and compulsory conversions. Compulsory conversions. What did I just say? What is the title of the book? Convert or die. That is compulsory conversion. But while doing it, he morally defended himself according to a witness in a high position. Indeed, when the Yugoslav government asked for his extradition from the United States, where he had taken refuge, because of uh, Operation Paperclip, probably, um, where he had taken refuge, someone spoke on his behalf. The R.P. Jesuit Lakovic, residing also in the United States, and secretary to Monsignor Stepinak, Archbishop of Zagreb, during the last war. Artukovic, states the Jesuit, was the lay spokesman of Monsignor Stepinak. Between 1941 and 1945, not one day went by without seeing him in my office or myself doing, uh, going to his. He asked the Archbishop's advice on all his actions as far as their moral aspect was concerned. When we know what the actions of this executioner were, we realize what kind of edifying moral advice Monsignor Stepinak gave him. Massacres and conversions took place until the liberation and the goodwill of the Holy Father towards the killers never altered. One must read in the Croatian Catholic newspaper of that time the exchanges of compliments between Antichrist Pope Pius XII and Pavelic. The Poglavnik, to whom Monsignor Saric, Jesuit Bishop of Sarajevo, and a poet in his spare time, dedicated verses impregnated with a rapturous adoration. Mm. But this was only a show of good manners. Monsignor Stepinak becomes member of the Ustashi Parliament. He wears Ustashi decorations. He is present at all important Eustachy official manifestations at which he even gives speeches. Must we then wonder at the respect given to Monsignor Stepinak by the satellite state of Croatia, or that his praises were sung by the Eustachy press? It is, alas, too evident that without the support of Monsignor Stepinak on the religious and political side, Ante Pavelic would never have obtained the collaboration of Catholic Croats to such an extent. Yeah, this was quite a reading today. Huh? Mm, absolutely. I will stop it here because we approach the hour and uh, I can then next time start on the top of page 146 
the 19th reading of this book. In the meantime, I'm just going to go through a few pictures here. We have Cardinal Archbishop Stekinat with per village in this picture. German Nazis, Italian fascists, Croatian Eustachi, the papal nuncio Ramiro Marcone with the white cassock here, and the Archbishop of Zagreb, Aloysiek Stepinak, who is in the black cassock here on the left. So interesting pictures where you see all these people that we have just read about all together. Yeah, sworn mm. together uh, against Jesus Christ, against the Bible, working for the agenda of the Antichrist. That's what I call this. This was quite an interesting reading. Even though we did not hear a lot of Brett, I think he enjoyed no. <laughs> listening listening live. But uh, oh, Brett, yeah. I, I, I want to leave you for maybe a few closing comments before I close uh, the, the broadcast for today. Is there anything that you have to say, maybe in a summary or whatever, of your understanding what we just read together? Well, certainly, uh, this is uh, tapping right into... Um, Topics that we've discussed before in the reading of the book, um, All Roads Lead to Rome, I believe we, you, would, you had read through that chapter on Poland. And um, I forget now what else. Um, certainly, uh, this has something to do with that. And um, there's a lot of... of uh, you know, my brother is, uh, you know, in he's a historian more or less, and he's been on this topic for a long time. And when I went to Europe, I uh, took the Ural Pass all the way down to Yugoslavia. I was there. And, um, yeah, it's very, very different than, uh, than Minnesota, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and uh, it was a shock. Um, I wish I would have had more time, to be frank. I didn't have much time in Europe. We were going through very quickly. and um, But uh, I'm fascinated by uh, the history. And uh, I was just looking up this term, uh, Ploglavnik, here used. And um, it's uh, Wikipedia right now. Um, this is some ty type of title that was given to him. Uh, I think it says here, uh, a Croatian term for the Latin word pre, uh, princeps. Um, but I just thought it was interesting that um, that I've never seen that word before, and I had to look it up. Um, but certainly, I really appreciate you reading this book, Yerk, and I know it's uh, a very advanced book. It's not uh, a uh, beginner's book by any means. And... Um, well, it helps, it helps, Brett, when you read this book that you have uh, already a starting knowledge of the Jesuit order. No, even, yes, exactly. Even though this book is titled The Secret History of the Jesuits, you say, oh, okay, I'm going to read that to get to know everything about the Jesuits. But the more that you are founded in real history, that you have already studied books like Rulers of Evil or even mm -hmm. uh, All Roads Lead to Rome, Mm -hmm. And many other books, like it was a big advantage to me that I see right now that I have been reading um, Behind the Dictators also. Yes, um, you're right. This is not a beginner's book. When you when you have that background knowledge, then it all comes together. You, you see the big picture after reading this book. And uh, mm. I am now on page 145, and we have 197 in this PDF, so it's just about 50 pages left, and... Uh, this was the 18th recording in German. I did, I think, 24 videos. I don't know if wow. uh, if I will do as many in English or pro or maybe even more. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. to depend on a little bit of the comments that I make also. This today right. was a f very fact-filled reading. So there was not the possibility or even the need to uh, extend with a lot of personal comments. I think the comment that I read to you about this gas chamber in Auschwitz is something that you really should think about. When there is a quote-unquote um, unrefutable person who states that the gas chamber was lying next to the chamber where the furnace is where they burned the bodies, just mm. think a second. Would you, oh, ever, yes. would you ever have a furnace heated at least a thousand degrees centigrade to to uh, put human bodies into ashes 
next to the chamber where you have a highly flammable gas? Would the Germans do that, who were always so precise in their things? I mean, it's just a thing to, a thing to think about, you know? And the point is that we know that the agenda of the Holocaust was needed because they needed, after the Belfort Declaration during the First World War, and the persecution of the Jews and other people like Protestants and Liberals and Orthodox in the Second World War, they needed for the Jews a quote-unquote home country. The Zionist movement had to build a new Israel because the future agenda, the futurist agenda of the Roman Catholic Church which proposes a futuristic antichrist and an unfulfilled 70 years week of Daniel needs Jews living in a country called Israel, needs them to build a third temple to replay what Jesus Christ has completely fulfilled 2000 years ago. I cannot but put the emphasis on this and therefore it doesn't matter if the Holocaust took place the way they tell us or it did not take place. The only important thing is that it took place in our heads and that because of that they can play their agenda and they can continue deceiving the people into that there needs to be a nation state of Israel which when you read the Bible is absolutely uh, redundant mm -hmm. because through grace you are saved the Gentiles and the Jews there is no mm -hmm. extra salvation for the Jews in Israel or in the third temple no that's not what the Bible teaches but the Roman Catholic Church of course does not teach the Bible it has their agenda and therefore it is very important that they implant these things and these thoughts into our minds so that we understand there was a persecution of the Jews and therefore they have this country right now and we accept it because if there wasn't that persecution we would never accept that country of Israel there in the Middle East especially with all the wars they have fought since 1948 and they are still fighting and mm. I keep continuing it my opinion mm. is that the state of Israel over there in Palestine or whatever you want to call that country that is nothing else but an open big concentration camp and we will see in the future how that works out yes so, that's right we will so Brett I thank you for your attendance in the recording of today we have come a little bit over an hour. Maybe there will be a possibility that you join me again. I would very much like it because it's always nicer to do this work and reading of a Great. book with two yes. instead of alone. If I'm around, I will. Absolutely right. And Thank you, Eric, for inviting me. Yeah, and technically it worked quite fine to have you here on Skype uh, all the time yes. with me. And uh, the recording went well and the people still see my desktop camera video and have your voice along with mine. So... I leave, I leave to you some closing remarks to say goodbye to all of you as Brett. Yes, Jörg, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to more of the readings coming up in the future. And uh, this is just another one to uh, add to the, the vast amount of information that uh, is uh, become very difficult to, to get your hands on. And, and, um, it's a uh, it's a privilege to be able to have someone take the time to to do these readings, Yerk. So I want to thank you as well for providing this for everyone at no cost and just taking your time and doing it out of love, out of the love of the Lord. So I think that's it for my comments. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Brett, for attending, and uh, I hope your boss will give you a slack of a day today that maybe we can continue <laughs> with another reading of Cold World Babylon. Who knows? When he doesn't call, maybe you have the time. Let's see. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for joining me today in the 18th reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits, the book by Edmund Paris, published in 1975. And uh, until next time, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye for listening. And until next time, bye-bye. And
a specialized work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.